the second basic tissue that we are going to talk about is connective tissues. The unique thing about connective tissues is that they have a lot of extracellular matrix. This is in contrast with epithelial tissues, which had minimal matrix, if any. These are the things we are going to learn under connective tissues. <clears throat> because we have said that the matrix is a lot, we are going to look at this matrix in details. We want to see what really makes up the matrix of connective tissues. Within that matrix are what we call connective tissue fibers. We are going to name the key types of connective tissue fibers and we are going to state the role of each. We are going to see how we classify connective tissues. We are going to notice that there are three major classifications. Embryonic connective tissues, so we are going to see the types of those. Generalized connective tissues, we are going to see the types of those and where they are found. And specialized connective tissues, which are many, but we are going to narrow down to these three, cartilage, bone, and adipose tissue. So let's start by first talking about components of connective tissues. Just like any other tissue, connective tissues consist of cells and extracellular matrix. I have avoided to talk about the interstitial fluid because of what I told you. We are not going to talk about structure of water in anatomy class. So <clears throat> we have cells and extracellular matrix. The extracellular matrix of connective tissues contain two things. This is what we call the ground substance, which is a gel that holds the cells together, like this one. It's a gel that holds the cells together. The other thing within the matrix is what we call connective tissue fibers. There are two types of connective tissue fibers. These fibers are usually proteins anyway. There are two types of connective tissue fibers. We have collagen fibers, which provide strength to connective tissues. And the second type is elastic fibers. Elastic fibers provide the recoil properties of connective tissues. The presence of elastic fibers is the one that enables you when you pinch your skin, your skin can go back to normal after you've stopped deforming it. You can do this to your pinna and it goes back to the original form after you've stopped deforming it because of the presence of elastic fibers. The matrix of connective tissues vary a lot. And because the matrix of connective tissues vary a lot, the classification of connective tissues is largely based on the characteristics of the matrix. It's largely based on the characteristics of the matrix. Therefore, let's see how we classify connective tissues. We can classify connective tissues under two major categories to start with. There are those connective tissues that we see it largely in the embryo. It means before birth. We see them less after that, but they're largely in the embryo. So we correctly call this type of connective tissue embryonic connective tissue. 
then the ones which are then seen postnatally would then survive till adulthood, and so we call that adult connective tissue. If we were to start with the embryonic connective tissues, there are two types of embryonic connective tissues. There is what we call mesenchyme, and there is what we call mucus tissues. Let's have a look at the embryonic connective tissues first before we talk about these ones. So we have said that we have two types of embryonic connective tissues, one of them being mesenchyme. What is mesenchyme? Mesenchyme is primitive embryonic connective tissue. Primitive to mean that the other connective tissues actually will be derived from mesenchyme. So this is the primary connective tissue that forms, then the other connective tissues will form from this one. It's a primitive form of connective tissue. This type of connective tissue contains spindle-shaped cells, as we can see here. And uh, a lot of ground substance with few collagen fibers. You, you can see fibers, yes, but you can also agree with me that the fibers are sparsely located. So there are few fibers, a lot of collagen, sorry, a lot of ground substance. The gel is more than the fibers. This is how mesenchyme looks like. The key thing here is that it is a primitive embryonic connective tissue. So the other tissues will come out of it. Bone, cartilage, ligaments, they'll come out from, first, they'll be mesenchyme. <clears throat> the second type of embryonic connective tissue is even more interesting. We call it mucus tissue. Mucus tissue is predominantly made up of ground substance. You hardly see cells or fibers. This is mucus tissue, this one. You hardly see cells or fibers. A lot of gel the ground substance. This type of connective tissue is called Watton's jelly and it is located around the umbilical cord. Now, uniquely, there are some regions in adults where we may still find mucus tissue. Watton's jelly is specifically in the embryo, in the fetus, around the umbilical cord. The connective tissue that's around the umbilical cord is called Watton's jelly. But this tissue can also be found in you and me. Now, where in adults do we find the mucus tissue? We find it in the tooth pulp. That central region of the tooth is what we call the tooth pulp. It contains mucus tissue. Also, the central part of the intervertebral disc, what we call nucleus pulposus, also contain mucus tissue. Right, so those are embryonic connective tissues. If we come to adult connective tissues, we can classify adult connective tissues this way we have what we call fibrous connective tissue and specialized connective tissue. You can call this category connective tissue with special properties. If you like shortcut, specialized connective tissue. This one has multiple names. I like calling it fibrous connective tissue but it can also be called connective tissue proper. Some people call it ordinary connective tissue. Some people call it generalized connective tissue. So 
ordinary connective tissue, generalized connective tissue, fibrous connective tissue, or connective tissue proper. All those are its names, I wonder why. We can classify fibrous connective tissues based on the amount of collagen fibers that this fibrous connective tissue contain. If it contains a lot of collagen fibers, it means that the collagen fibers are densely packed, then you call it dense connective tissue. If the collagen fibers are not densely packed, they're loosely packed, then you call that loose connective tissue. If the fibers are densely packed, you want to see whether those fibers are running in the same direction or in different direction. If the fibers are running in a uniform direction, then it will be regular. And so we call that dense regular connective tissue. If the fibers are running in all directions, then we call that dense irregular connective tissue. Let's look at the fibrous connective tissues. So fibrous connective tissue can be loose connective tissue, which means that uh, the collagen fibers are sparse. Now, this is what I mean by sparse. I know if you compare this with the previous two that we've talked about, you feel like there's a lot of fibers here, but just, just drives the point home that in the previous ones, there was paucity of collagen. There was a lot of ground substance, a unique feature of embryonic connective tissues. But this is still being considered sparse, especially if we compare it with what we are going to see next about what we actually call dense. The dense ones is actually dense. So this is still sparse. The fibers are sparsely spaced. They're also a bit thinner, but you can forget about that. Now of note is that you see a lot of cells. There are a lot of cells with sparse fibers. This type of connective tissue tend to be found beneath the epithelial lining that cover body surfaces. So we have mentioned regions where there's epithelium. Beneath those epithelial lining, you may find loose connective tissue. I will give you two examples. There's what you call lamina propria. Lamina propria is the loose connective tissue beneath the epithelium of the digestive as well as respiratory tree. The loose connective tissue beneath the epithelium in digestive and respiratory tree. Another example I want to give you is what you call papillary dermis. Papillary dermis is the loose connective tissue beneath the epidermis. Right, the other term that can be given for this type of connective tissue is loose areolar tissue. That's the name given to loose connective tissue. Okay, matching on. Now we talk about the dense connective tissues. We say that fibrous tissue can either be dense or loose. Now the dense one, means that the collagen fibers are closely packed together. Look at this. Now you agree with me that this is actually dense. You can see fibers are closely packed. Now, if we have dense connective tissue, then you want to classify them based on the direction of collagen fibers. In this one, the collagen fibers are running in the same direction. For that reason, we call it dense regular connective tissue. Dense regular connective tissue is found in tendons, ligaments, and aponeurosis. Maybe someone tell me what tendons are. 
another tell me what ligaments are, and another what aponeurosis are. Well, I can offer aponeurosis, but at least you can tell me tendons and ligaments. Anyone, any of the two, tendons or ligaments, whichever you want to define. Ligaments, they join bones together. Very good. So ligaments join bone to bone. Tendons join muscles to bone. Very good. Tendons join muscle to bone. Now, the difference between tendons and aponeurosis is that tendons tend to be cord like, like a cord. They are cord like structures, as opposed to aponeurosis, which are membranous structures. But they both join muscle to bone. If dense connective tissue is not regular, then it is irregular. The fibers run in different directions, as we can see in this image. The fibers are closely packed and they run in different directions. Examples of dense irregular connective tissue include what we call reticular dermis. Reticular dermis is the deeper sides of the dermis the part of the dermis that is not close to the epithelial lining. So those deeper parts of the dermis is called reticular dermis, as opposed to papillary dermis, which is the part of the dermis next to the epithelial lining. Papillary dermis is loose connective tissue. Reticular dermis is dense, irregular connective tissue. Submucosa is another region Submucosa is the dense connective tissue lining of internal hollow organs like alimentary canal, respiratory tree. They will have a very thick or let me say dense connective tissue layer that confers strength to those organs. We call that submucosa. Great, so we've talked about fibrous connective tissues. Before we leave that chapter, I want us to <clears throat> agree on something. What are really the components of fibrous connective tissues? Just like any other connective tissue, fibrous connective tissues are made up of cells and the matrix. But I want us to elaborate further on the components of the matrix of fibrous connective tissues, as well as the components of the matrix, sorry, components of the cells of fibrous connective tissues. Let's start with the components of the matrix. We have agreed that the matrix of connective tissues and fibrous connective tissue is not the exception, is made up of connective tissue fibers as well as ground substance. We've also said that connective tissue fibers consist of collagen fibers and elastic fibers. Now I want to elaborate on these collagen fibers. Collagen fibers confer strength to connective tissues. There are different varieties of collagen fibers. We name them according to the numbers perhaps how they were discovered. The last time I checked, there were over 27 or around 27 types. The objective is not for you to know where each collagen type is found, but at least you can know the first four types. So let's name them. Collagen type one is a very thick type of collagen that is the one we find largely in fibrous connective tissues. So things like tendons, ligaments, aponeurosis will have collagen type one, very thick type of collagen. Collagen type two is a very thin type of collagen. It is unique to cartilage tissues. So we don't find it in fibrous connective tissue. We find it in cartilage tissues. Collagen type three is the one that is also known as reticular fibers. 
it tends to coexist with collagen type 1. They coexist. Predominantly found in the dermis of the skin. That's why we call that region reticular dermis. Also found in organs such as liver and spleen. They provide strength in those organs. We call it reticular because it's highly branched. Then collagen type 4 is found in the basement membrane of epithelial tissues, the one we've just talked about. I will keep collagen to collagen type 4, but I've told there are over 20. The other type of connective tissue fiber is elastic fibers. We find elastic fibers where we need recoil. Elastic fibers also tend to coexist with collagen, but now the proportions vary depending on how much elasticity is needed in the tissue in question. So things like dummies will still have collagen type 1, will still have collagen type 3, and also elastic fibers within. The proportions vary. We put elastic fibers where you need recoil properties, remember. For ground substance, the ground substance is a gel. This gel may contain organic substances, but may also contain inorganic substances. In tissues such as bone, the inorganic substances are a lot in form of calcium and phosphate that constitute mineralization of the matrix. Let me leave the ground substance to that level. There's a lot to say here, but a lot of it is molecular and biochemistry. I don't think it's necessary for us. Let's talk about this side. The cells of fibrous connective tissues are grouped into two based on whether they are always there or they come and live. The ones which are always there are the following. We have what you call fibroblasts. Fibroblasts are the synthetic cells of fibrous connective tissues. They are the synthetic cells of fibrous connective tissues. So they're the ones that form the matrix. Then we have myofibroblasts. Myofibroblasts are contractile cells of fibrous connective tissues. They are contractile cells, they contract. Their contraction promote healing. For example, if there is injury, and so there's a scar that is, there's a wound, these are the cells that contract to reduce the size of a wound. Adipocytes are fat cells. So there are fat cells which are found in fibrous connective tissue. Usually, you'll find one or two adipocytes scattered within fibrous connective tissue. They are fat cells. Lastly, there are those that we call mesenchymal stem cells. As the name suggests, they are stem cells. They are the ones which give rise to the other cell types. These ones are resident cells. Then there's a category of cells which migrate. It means they're not constantly within that fibrous connective tissue, but they can invade it. They can also go back. Largely, these are white blood cells. So they invade these fibrous connective tissues for the primary purpose of fighting infections. We have several categories. For today, we'll just list the categories without going to the details. We have lymphocytes, we have granulocytes, and we have macrophages. I want to talk about these ones, the macrophages. Macrophages of, or rather, let me say this, that macrophages are immune cells that engulf 
infections, break them down, and then present them to lymphocytes. There are different types of macrophages in the body, different varieties of macrophages in the body. We name them according to where they are found. The macrophages that are found in fibrous connective tissues are known as histiocytes. Those are macrophages in fibrous connective tissue. They are known as histiocytes. There are many other types of macrophages. They go with different names depending on the tissue involved. And that therefore brings me to the assignment I want to give you. So this will be your take home assignment. You can write it down. In this take home assignment, you will name different varieties of macrophages in the body. And you'll indicate the primary tissue or organ that each is found. So for example, you say that we have histiocytes. That is one variety. The tissue here is fibrous connective tissue. Now you'll name the others and you'll find right where they're found. It will be nice to have a list of a list of maybe eight to ten. Then you'll have done your assignment well. That one you'll do at home at your own time. I'm not marking; it's yours. Okay. Let's proceed. Kuna mungina kwenye mira na skia. So. We are done with fibrous connective tissues. Now let's talk about this column here. Adult connective tissues can be grouped into fibrous connective tissues and specialized connective tissues. When we talk of specialized connective tissues, we mean adipose tissue, cartilage tissue, bone tissue. There are two others that I'm going to mention later, but I want us to discuss these three first. Adipose, cartilage, and bone tissue. Let's begin with adipose tissue. Now, adipocytes refer to fat cells. But which tissue are we calling adipose tissue? Adipose tissue refer to tissues where the adipocytes at the primary cell types. In the previous type of tissue, we talked about fibrous connective tissue. We've seen that adipocytes could be part of those tissues, but that does not qualify them to be called adipose tissue. You call a tissue adipose tissue if the adipocytes are the primary cells, like what we see here. All these are adipocytes, they're just full of fat. What are the key functions of adipose tissue? The primary role of adipose is in energy homeostasis, either by the fact that it's an energy reserve, you can break down fat when there's no carbohydrate. It forms the basis of why people lose weight when they fast. But also these fat cells produce some chemicals which are able to mobilize energy for metabolism. They have insulin-like effects. Those hormones have insulin-like effects and so they affect metabolism of energy. There are two types of adipose tissue. There's one where the fat cells are just full of one fat locule. You can call that fat unilocular fat, other is called white fat. This is the type of fat that we see in you and me. It's the one that's predominant in you and me. It's the one that is usually found beneath the skin, which we now call panniculus adiposus. That's the one found beneath the skin, 
panniculus adiposus. What are the functions of this fat? It will still store energy. So you can use it when there's no carbohydrate. It will still insulate you against um, temperature loss. Cushioning is important. That's why if, if I fall with my buttocks, I might injure myself, have a fracture of my bones. If one of you, maybe someone falls, there'll be no effect because there's enough cushion. Also, these cells produce some hormones as I've already talked about. The second type of fat is what we call brown fat. If you look at these fat cells, you'll see multiple locules within each cell. Brown fat is multilocular. This type of fat is what we see in the fetus and also in a newborn baby. The primary role of this fat is in energy, in production of heat, that is thermogenesis. So it's important for thermoregulation primarily. <coughs> Sorry. Important for thermoregulation. Right, let's look at the second specialized connective tissue. The second specialized connective tissue is cartilage tissue. Cartilage is unique in that it is rigid, which means can prevent collapse, but also flexible, you can bend it, very unique. Histologically, cartilage tissues have collagen type two, which is unique to them. Also, cartilage tissues do not have blood vessels. They are a vascular. That's why you are advised if you're pricking your ear, you don't prick where there is cartilage, you don't prick on the upper part, because that cartilage is a vascular, it will not heal faster. If you are supposed to prick your ear, if you need to, you prick on the lower side where there's no cartilage. It will heal faster. There are multiple functions of cartilage and this will largely depend on where they are found. Now, let's go through the different types of cartilage tissue. There are three types of cartilage tissue. The first type of cartilage tissue is what we call hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage is unique by the presence of a very uniform matrix. The term hyaline means uniform. And also the cells of hyaline cartilage are very tiny. Smaller cells and uniform matrix. Where do you find hyaline cartilage? This is the type of cartilage we find in the larynx, trachea, and the bronchial tree. We also find it in synovial joints, the ends, the line, the ends of bones in synovial joints. We find it at the junction between the ribs and the sternum. We find it forming the skeleton of the embryo and we find it in the growth plate of long bones. This is hyaline cartilage, the most abundant type of cartilage, actually. The second type of cartilage is what we call elastic cartilage. Elastic cartilage is called so because it has a lot of elastic fibers within its matrix. This deeply staining structure in this unique type of stain is actually designed to pick elastic fibers. And so we can confidently say that this type of cartilage has a lot of elastic fibers. Also, if you notice, it has very large cells. So large cells and a lot of elastic fibers within the matrix. This is what makes it very flexible. We find elastic cartilage in the epiglottis also in the pin of the ear. I believe you all know where epiglottis is. This is the pin of the ear. The last type of cartilage is what we call fibrocartilage. You can call it fibrous cartilage. F 
fibrous cartilage is called so because it is predominantly fibrous. Actually, it has a lot of collagen type 1. This one has a lot of collagen type 1. That's what you're seeing there running parallel, actually. It has a lot of collagen type 1. Highly fibrous, very few cells, as you can see. You can even count them. This type of cartilage is found in the intervertebral discs. There's a junction between vertebrae. Also found in the knee. Specifically in the knee, we call them menisci. These are the discs that separate tibia and femur. We find it in the lip of the acetabulum. The lip of the acetabulum is called acetabular labrum. The acetabulum is a socket of the hip joint. So the lip of that socket contain fibrocartilage. A similar thing is found in the socket of the shoulder, which we call now glenoid labrum. So acetabular labrum and glenoid labrum, those ones are made up of fibrocartilage. And finally, we find this type of cartilage where we have a symphysis. A symphysis is a type of a joint. A good example is pubic symphysis. There are other symphysial joints in the body. They contain fibrocartilage. So I've taken you through the characteristics of cartilage and the different types of cartilage, including where they are found. Let's talk about modes of cartilage growth. How does cartilage grow? Cartilage grows based on two modes. There is what we call interstitial growth. Interstitial growth of cartilage is growth from within, from inside. The cells within the cartilage are the ones which undergo mitosis. They are the ones which lay down the matrix. So we call that interstitial growth of cartilage. Interstitial growth of cartilage contribute to increase in length of the cartilage. This is different from what we call a positional growth. A positional growth of cartilage is growth of cartilage from the sides or from the surface, where the cells on the surface are the ones which lay down the matrix. This type of growth of cartilage increases the width or the girth of cartilage tissues. Those are the two types of cartilage growth. Right, so that's the story of cartilage. I want to give you this question you are going to discuss in your groups now that we've already talked about cartilage and where it is found. I want you people to discuss in your groups the functions of cartilage tissue. So you'll be doing this as I take the roll call for the class. I'm giving you five minutes to discuss this as I take the roll call. So, okay. It is uh, 5.47, so we come back at, okay, I'll recall you back at 5.55. I'm dividing into your groups, you're not going far. So you just discuss as I take the roll call of the class. Okay, let me create that. Okay, so join your groups and discuss that question.
All right, welcome back. I hope you're done with that. So I'll ask you to allow me push you for the next 10, 15 minutes, then you'll be done with the class. <clears throat> the third specialized connective tissue we are going to talk about is bone tissue. The unique thing about bone tissue is that the matrix of bone is heavily mineralized. What are the functions of bone tissue? Bone provides structural support. If there was no bone, it will just be a heap of meat. So it provides structural support. Bone also protect internal organs. For example, the skull protects the brain, the ribs protect the lungs and the heart, the vertebral column protects the spinal cord. Bone is also important for movement together with the muscular system. <clears throat> Bone is also a very large reserve for calcium. Over 90 or even over 95 percent of body calcium is within bone. We can also say that bone marrow, those cavities within bone, is a site of formation of blood. There are two histological types of bone. We have what we call spongy bone. This is spongy bone. Spongy bone is also known as cancellous bone or trabecular bone. This type of bone tend to be inside and it's the one that contain cavities, the bone marrow. That is different from the second type of bone, which are calling cortical bone. This is cortical bone. Cortical bone tends to be external and it does not contain cavities. Radiologically, Cortical bone will look like this, and uh, spongy bone would look like this. What are the cell types in bone tissue? There are about five cell types in bone tissue. We have what you call osteoprogenitor cells. These cells are bone stem cells they give rise to the other cell types. They are therefore important for regeneration. So osteoprogenitor cells give rise to osteoblasts in particular. Osteoblasts are the immature, immature to mean not mature, they are the immature cells of bone tissue. They are the, actually the synthetic cells of bone. They're the ones which lay down the matrix of bone. So we can say they are bone forming cells. Osteocytes are mature bone cells. When osteoblasts have formed a lot of matrix around them, they mature to become osteocytes. So osteocytes, are mature bone cells. These mature bone cells maintain the matrix of bone. We have osteoclasts. Osteoclasts are bone macrophages. In the assignment I gave you a few minutes ago, you will add on that list osteoclasts as being another example of, of macrophages. And these are macrophages which are found specifically in bone tissue. Now, the unique thing about osteoclasts, therefore, is that uh, it will not arise from this lineage. Don't say that osteoprogenitor give you osteoblast, then osteoblast give you osteocytes, then now osteocytes give you this one. That's not true. Osteoclasts are macrophages, so that means they come from the bloodstream, basically. They come from the bloodstream and they invade bone, but now they reside in bone. And uh, 
they are not primarily for immunity like any other macrophage. Osteoclasts are the ones which break down bone tissue. The process of breaking down bone tissue is what we call bone resorption. The last cell types of bone are known as bone lining cells. These cells control the amount of ions which enter or leave bone tissue. Now let's talk about the matrix of bone. The matrix of bone is laid down in layers. These layers are hereby called the lamella systems. You can see the layering. There is layering of the matrix. We call that the lamella system. There are four types of lamella systems in bone. The first one is what you call the Havetian system of lamellae. This is what constitutes the Havetian system. You have a channel that contains blood vessels. Such a channel is known as Havetian canal or vascular channel. It's a channel that contains blood vessels. Around that channel, you have concentric lamellae. So this concentric lamellae around the Havetian canal is what we call the Havetian system. The Havetian system is also known as the osteon. The osteon is the functional unit of bone. The osteon, the functional unit of bone. There's another lamella system. Now these ones are running on the outside of bone. They are layers, but they're running concentrically around the bone on near the outer surface in the circumference. So we call them the outer circumferential lamellae. Outer circumferential lamellae. Compare that with these ones. They are still circumferential, but on the inner side. So we call them inner circumferential lamellae. The last type of lamellae are these ones, which are between different osteons. We call that the interstitial lamellae. So the concept here is that the matrix of bone is not random. It is laid down in layers. There are four types of layer systems. There are four types of lamellar system. Out of those four, the aversion system is the functional unit of bone. How does bone form? Bone forms through two mechanisms. There's one which you call endochondral ossification. The term ossification means bone formation. In endochondral ossification, we have cartilage being laid down first. Chondro refers to cartilage. So in endochondral ossification, there is cartilage that's being laid down first. Then this cartilage is slowly changed or replaced by bone, as you can see here. That is endochondral ossification. And this type of ossification apply for long bones, bones such as tibia, femur, humerus, those long bones develop from endochondral ossification. In contrast to what we call intramembranous ossification. Intramembranous ossification is where bone is forming through a connective tissue membrane. There's a membrane of connective tissue that forms first. Then slowly, this membrane is transformed to bone. This type of ossification applies to the flat bones of the skull. They form from intramembranous ossification. They do not require a cartilage model. 
it explains to you why sometimes in people with achondroplasia where there's difficulty in forming cartilage, they'll be very short, but their head will still be the size that is expected for the, that particular age because the skull bones, especially the one on top, will just continue to grow normally. But the ones that rely on cartilage will be small. <clears throat> okay. One final break. This one I'm giving you two minutes. We've talked about cartilage. We've talked about bone. Now discuss amongst yourselves the differences between cartilage and bone. Two minutes only because you talked about them.
Okay, I believe you're all back. Now let's finish the lecture this way. <clears throat> we have said that uh, we classify connective tissues as embryonic and adult, depending on where they are found. The embryonic connective tissues are particularly unique by having a lot of ground substance. We've agreed that there are two types of embryonic connective tissue. Mesenchyme is a primitive form of embryonic connective tissue that will give rise to the other connective tissues. Mucus tissue is predominantly just ground substance, few cells, few fibers. Examples where it's found Watton's jelly around the umbilical cord, but we also see it in adults. The central part of the intervertebral disc, what we call nucleus pulposus, has it. And the tooth pulp also has it. The adult type of connective tissue can be grouped into two, the fibrous and the specialist one. The fibrous connective tissue can be classified as dense or loose depending on the number, the amount of collagen fibers one has. The loose connective tissue is also called areolar tissue. We find this one in lamina propria. We also find it in the papillary dermis. The dense connective tissue can be classified as regular or irregular, depending on the direction of these collagen fibers. The, regular, the dense regular connective tissue include things like tendons, ligaments, and aponeurosis. The dense irregular connective tissue include submucosa. It includes the reticular dermis. Specialized connective tissue are unique in their own way. I've taken you through three types of specialized connective tissue. Adipose tissue, cartilage tissue, and bone tissue. You've discussed functions of cartilage, and you've discussed the histological differences between these two. There are two other specialized connective tissue which we are not going to discuss, but I want you to know that they exist. Lymphoid tissue, is largely responsible for defense against infections. You do this better in immunology, and that's why I'm not discussing it here. There's a whole unit for it. Blood is also specialized connective tissue. Again, we'll have a whole lecture on blood tissue in physiology, so I don't want to talk about it here. Otherwise, these are still specialized connective tissues. So we are now done with the lecture. Tomorrow, we'll be looking at excitable tissues under physiology, and specifically, we'll be looking at the nervous tissue. All right, so we'll stop there. If there's a question, you can ask. <clears throat>